Good morning, my name is Mark Lucenius, and I'm the lead pastor for Project 938, and I want to give a warm welcome uh, to all who are out there. Some of you are on Church Online, some of you are on Facebook, some of you are on YouTube, some of you are driving in a car on vacation, some of you are on your vacation, and some of you are nestled in at home. I hope you've got this up on the big screen and are able to enjoy it, uh, maybe with some friends, maybe with some family. Uh, speaking of family, Today we're going to talk about some family reunions. I don't know that we're going to be able to pull ours off this summer. It's just a few of us that we would pull together. But the first like, like classic family reunion that I can remember was when uh, my mom came to me. I was about 11 years old and she said, we're going to Detroit. I'm like, why are we going to Detroit? We're going to have a family reunion. I'm like, we have family? In Detroit? It turns out that my mother had a brother in Detroit. And no, that's not a lame rap song. It was true. My mother had a brother in Detroit, and we were going to go to Detroit. And so it was my, my three siblings, my mom, my dad, my sister was married at that time. We get ourselves, we fly to Detroit, and we, we, we get, rent ourselves a car. This is the first time I'd ever done anything like this. Anything. We've never had like a family trip ever. And so we get ourselves in the car and we drive all the way over um, into like kind of like this sort of the suburbs, but not the suburbs, but like sort of like this nice little neighborhood. And we pull ourselves in. We pull in like kind of late afternoon or so. It's like around this time of the year. And uh, we, we walk up and and we I, I distinctly remember being able to see through the screen door. And there's like somebody sitting at the kitchen table and we knock. And nothing happens. And we knock again. And that the, pers the person at the table kind of looks over and kind of wanders over. And we're like, hey, we're here! And she said in the most welcoming way you can imagine, oh, you came. Now, this is the day before emails and before text messages and before cell phones, but somehow they didn't necessarily get the, well, they didn't know we were coming. And, and when the Lysenias has come to show up for a party, they show up for a party. And, but like, they were not ready for us. And we sort of take, took over their little Detroit home and uh, they weren't ready for us. My two distinct memories of being there be, beyond some time in a park or whatever. But I remember this big tray of lunch meats that got put out there. And that was sort of like the food for like three days. And it kind of stayed out on the table. It was real. I remember one of my, my sister's husband saying, let's go. I'm going to go get you some real food. So it was so weird. It was so weird. It was so awkward. And we never had a family reunion ever again. Uh, and maybe it was us. Maybe it was them. But we weren't invited back. There was never a big old family reunion ever again. Uh, well, we, there are specific moments in Scripture where the family of God comes together. And there's some pretty interesting story. Also sort of awkwardness. I want to tell you, we're going to start one right at the beginning of the Bible and one at the end of the Bible. Uh, at the end of the book of Genesis, uh, Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons and daughters, and, and he, he's just about ready to die. And so he brings the entire family together. Now, it's not like they're just kind of like living next door. So, like, it was a big undertaking. All the sons come, and they bring their families, and Jacob's, like, laying in the bed, and, you know, he, he, he's going to give his blessing. And they're going to kind of find out what Jacob really thinks of them. And so, typically speaking, he puts a superstar blessing on the firstborn, and everybody else gets, like, something kind of average. Well, the firstborn, Reuben, he don't get, he, he kind of got, like, a, a beat down. And then the next one, and the next one. And then they came to Judah. And I want you to hear, I want you to hear at the big old Jacob's family reunion. Uh, Jacob was named Israel. So this is the Israel family reunion. I want you to hear what Judah, or I'm sorry, what Jacob had to say about his son Judah. Now the entire family's there, right? And so this is what Jacob has to say. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until 
he, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Jacob said about Judah that he is going to be the star and that every, every one of the sons, well, they're going to have to obey Judah. And not just the sons, but the entire world eventually. And that, I guess, is made the whole potato salad conversation just a little bit awkward later that day. Because nobody expected that. Nobody expected that. He's the fourth you, you reserve words like that for your firstborn. Uh, but Judah, well, where did that come from? Well, that was very ancient. And in some ways, it was forgotten. Uh, it was forgotten for years. And Israel went through some really hard times, really difficult times. Uh, the nation split, and ten of and ten of the brothers that became tribes, well, they ended up getting lost into a sea of the Assyrian army as they were taken away. And then eventually, it was just Judah. And it was later on, like even like a thousand years later, and the rabbis started trying to understand what was going on. They they realized that this wasn't just like Jacob playing favorites. This was a prophecy, and the prophecy had come true. That Jacob really did hold on to things, that God had honored him, and that the lion of Judah was still going strong. It's still fighting things off, but like nations, had, in a thousand years, nations had come and gone. They'd come and gone, Hittites, Amalekites, Edomites, all these nations had come and gone, but the Israelites, they were still there. I mean, it was just Judah but the lion of the tribe of Judah held on. And so they started, they started developing this vision and this hope around the lion of the tribe of Judah. Because they remember David. David was the great king that had come from Judah. And there was a prophecy that one day one of his sons would sit on that throne. And the, and, and the promise is that all the nations would come to him. That would come true. That the lion of the tribe of Judah would emerge once again. And, and it became this faint hope, and they would point, and they would hold on hope. And when Jesus came, it actually messed everything up. And people misunderstood Jesus almost his entire life, because when Jesus came, they're like, surely this is the son of David. Surely all the prophecies point to this one. Surely this, you know, he does all these miracles. He speaks as, he's, as if he's the Messiah. He acts as if he's the Messiah. He has authority as if he's the Messiah. We would want to follow him. We feel like the whole nation should follow him. And they just kept misunderstanding him because they're expecting him to be a lion. Now, why would you put your hope in a lion? In those days, they didn't like, you know, have like leash laws on your animals. Animals just roamed. And uh, not, not every Israelite had seen a lion, but they heard about lions. And they heard lions. Lions, lions would roam in the wilderness and in the countryside, and they would hear the roar of a lion for miles away. Shepherds would come and tell stories about how a lion just jumped in and grabbed, grabbed the animals and grabbed the lambs and the sheep and just took them away. And you wouldn't even fight against a lion. You'd just let it go. They knew that a lion could lead them. They knew that a lion could protect them. In their, in their imagery, in their, in, in their vision, they, they sort of saw the world as, and all their enemies as beasts. Sometimes they felt like they were just sheep getting ready to be slaughtered by these beasts, but they knew that the lion of Judah could protect them. They hoped that that lion would emerge and protect them. And when Jesus came, they're like, clearly, here's the lion, and he's going to wipe out the Romans. And they misunderstood him all the way to the cross. But we know there was a resurrection, and after the resurrection, the church formed, the church bl blossomed. And it was 80 years later, 80, 90 years later, that the church found itself a lot like that, those, those Israelites, kind of, kind of lost, kind of scattered. It was, it was around 90 AD, and almost all the apostles had been killed. 
Uh, they had been martyred. You know, Peter was, was crucified upside down. Others were crucified. Uh, some were burned at the stakes. Some were thrown to animals. In all sorts of ways, the apostles and many, many, many other Christians had died and suffered, and they had been spread throughout, uh, spread throughout the Roman world. And John, John the Apostle, he was the only one left. He was, he was exiled for his faith to the island of Patmos. And people were wondering, they were wondering how we were going to prevail. They had hoped that Jesus would have come back sooner. They had hoped that he would come back to make things right, but he hadn't. And while he was there, he was given a vision. He was given a vision of a different family reunion. When God's people had come together. I, I, I want to read for you a vision that, that John had of the end of time, of heaven itself. Uh, literally the courtyard of heaven, of seeing God in, in the very presence of heaven. And I want you to listen and just hear how he describes it. We don't know if this is actually what it is like. We just know that this is what God wanted us to see through John's eyes. He says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. As John speaking, he said, I wept and wept because no one was found who is worthy to open the scroll or look inside. John is seeing a picture of heaven and, and, and he's seeing God Almighty on the throne and, and, and he's, God Almighty is holding out in his right hand a, a scroll that looks a lot like this, uh, except it's written on, on both sides. It, it's filled up on both sides all the way to the edges. Typically speaking, they would unroll it, unroll a scroll, and they would read it side to side, and they'd read, and they and they kind of keep rolling it out and rolling it out. But but this one had seven seals, just like this one. And you can't open the scroll unless you break the seal. Uh, and what John is realizing, John is realizing, is that in that scroll is the meaning of history. In that scroll is the meaning of his life. In that scroll is the meaning of his suffering. In that scroll is, is, is the story of the destiny of humanity. Of, of, of why all things exist and why he exists and what would happen. He saw in that scroll the meaning of his life. And no one could open it. We all long to see what's inside that scroll. We all long to understand what the meaning of our lives are. We all long to understand the meaning of COVID. We all long to understand our isolation. We all long to understand our suffering. We all long to know that somebody has a plan. Somebody has a purpose for it. And the tension for John to know that there was an answer that he could not access. The, to, for John to see the purity and the perfection and the greatness of heaven, knowing from the darkness of which he was, he, he was brought up into that vision, from, and to know that purity, to live in this tension, and to know that there's an answer and he can't get it, he just weeps and he weeps and he weeps. And I think in his tears... There's a connection to our tears as well. Because I think we wonder also. We wonder why, we, why, our, why our kids are losing out on opportunities. We wonder why we're losing out on opportunities. We wonder why we are losing loved ones. We are wondering why we have to live with so much division and pain. We wonder why mental health troubles is spiking right now. Could there be meaning for it? Could there be purpose around it? And John sees that there's... 
that there's possibly purpose, but no one can access it. And heaven is silent. There's just a silence in heaven, except John sobbing. The angels have nothing to say. I think for a lot of us, in John's tears, might be a connection to some of the things that we ache for that we can't put words to. We long for that we can't even say, or we long for or we're afraid to ask for it. And what I want you to see in heaven is that heaven sees it as well. Not an angel steps forward. Not any of the other beings there in heaven steps forward. Heaven recognizes the difference between what we experience and what heaven offers. And is quiet. John's just weeping and weeping and weeping. And somebody comes up to him. Then one of the elders, I picture this as like Gandalf or like Dumbledore or something like that. One of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. There at the ultimate and final family gathering, the Lion of Judah reappears as the one who is worthy. He is the one who is worthy to open the scrolls. Jesus is that Lion. He is the Root of David. He is the one who is worthy to know the truth. He is the one who is worthy to know about your destiny, our destiny, the meaning of our sufferings, the meaning of our troubles. And he is a Lion. He is powerful enough for that. He is powerful enough to break the scrolls. He is strong enough to break the scrolls. He is good enough to break the scrolls. He is, I'm sorry, he is to break the seals. He is the one who is worthy. But I want you to see something that, that is going to surprise John and I think surprise us as well. Because the elder, from heaven's perspective, he, the elder says, look, there's the line of the tribe of Judah. But when John looks over, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. When he looked, he didn't see a lion, but he saw a lamb. See, the, the lion that we, that we want is also the lamb that we need. The mystery of all history is that God wins not through a show of power, but through a demonstration of love and of suffering. Listen to what, listen to the explosion, the explosion of enthusiasm and worship that happens in heaven when they realize that it's not just a lion, but it's also a lamb. So then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. Yes, that's weird, if you're wondering. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before a lamb, each one had a harp, and they were all in golden bowls for of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because... You were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then John says, Then I looked and heard the, the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand they encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice, and they're saying, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb 
be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. See the ultimate family reunion, not just, not just the Luciniuses is coming together, not just a few families together, not just one church coming together, not just a, a few churches not coming together, not a denomination coming together, not the churches of, of a nation coming together, but all the pe but people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, a true multinational group of community people, family, brothers and sisters from all time, all history, finally come together around the one is worthy, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who is also the Lamb. We weep over our divisions, but there is one who is worthy of bringing every culture together, the Lion of Judah. Why? It's not because of his power, but because of his suffering. Now, what, what would, who would you say is the greatest lion of movie history? Greatest lion of movie history. There's two nominations. There's Mufasa and there's Aslan. All right, so uh, if, you, uh, if you vote Mufasa, feel free to go ahead and put that in the chat in the comment feature. Raise your hand. All right. If you vote Aslan, you can write that in the chat or the comment section and uh, go ahead or, or raise your hand where you are. Um, I, I'm just going to declare it's Aslan because I think Aslan's awesome. If you know that, if you know the story of Aslan, you'll know that he was the one who created the land of Narnia by his singing voice. He created this beautiful world, but somebody had infiltrated it. And there's something, there's somebody that infiltrated it with darkness and eventually there came a time where this beautiful land of Narnia was entered into by four brothers, four brothers and sisters, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. Edmund, though, got drawn away. Edmund got drawn away and got drawn in by the one who had infiltrated Narnia. And Edmund got turned into an enemy of Aslan. And the, and the whole story comes together where there's a moment where the queen of Narnia, the, the evil queen of Narnia, confronts Aslan. And Aslan had invited Edmund into Narnia. And the, queen of, and the queen of Narnia says, this one here, he belongs to me. He is a traitor. And we know that, you, we know that according to the deep magic, anyone who betrays in such a way needs to die, and the queen demands Edmund's blood. Aslan takes a walk with the queen, and Aslan returns and says, the queen has relinquished her claim on Edmund's life. And everyone was so happy. Everyone was so happy, and everyone went back and they celebrated. But Aslan was sad. He was quiet. And later that night, he took a long walk. Lucy and Susan followed. And in that long walk, they, they, in following Aslan, they, they found that he had come to the White Witch and all her evil minions with him. And it was there at that awful place that they realized why Edmund was released from uh, the Queen's demands. is because Aslan shed his blood for Edmund. Aslan climbed up on a stone table, and the witch took his life. Susan and Lucy wept and wept and wept. Right before, right before taking his life, the queen says, and I'm going to take the lives of everyone else you protected in Narnia. Lucy and Susan wept and wept and wept, and they waited and they waited and waited, and they didn't know what to do until they heard this crack, this unbelievable sound. And they ran back, and they had come to that table, and they realized that the table had broken, and Aslan was gone. 
And they're like, oh no, they, they took his body to do something more awful with it. And they started running off until they, until they heard something behind them. And they turned around. And there was Aslan alive. And they said, Aslan, what had happened? And, and we realized that somehow because of the deep magic, you had to give your life. And Aslan said, no, there was a deeper magic. There was a deeper magic that when an innocent victim gives their life for someone who is guilty, it breaks the initial magic. And when the stone table broke, it broke the rule that held them back. It's a picture, it's a perfect picture of Jesus, whose death on the cross has broken sin and shame, has, takes everything from our past and sets us behind and lets us live forward into the life that the lion of the tribe of Judah has won for us. He did not win it through his power, though. He won it through his suffering. We have a lion. The lion suffered like a lamb. And this passage teaches us that he, he has made you and me into a kingdom. An alternative order of society that's not based on political rules or cultural norms or the things that move this world around. But it's a society based upon love and sacrifice in an entirely different way of being. It's not a political end in itself. It is a global subversive movement of love that changes the world not through the roar of a lion, but through the suffering of a lamb. It says we, he has made us into priests. Priests over that time were the nexus between God and man, but now all those who are followers of the Lion of Tribe of Judah are now priests, representatives of his love and care. And not through an extension of power, but through a demonstration of love and acceptance. There is a day that we look forward to where the Lion of Judah will prevail over all evil, and it will be the end of suffering and sadness. But we can prevail in the meantime. How? Not in the roar of a lion, not with the teeth or claws of a lion, not in our performance, not in how awesome the church could be. But in love, patience, perseverance, vulnerability. Our ability to suffer well demonstrates that our hope isn't here. Our hope isn't something so much better, so much purer, so much more beautiful, so much more wonderful. A place where there is a scroll with the meaning of our life waiting to be unfolded before us. So we can suffer well, we can endure well. Our hope is not in the strength of what we can achieve together, but in the meaning and purpose of our suffering of which... Jesus holds for us. Our endurance, our courage, our faithfulness, our love for one another, our patience, our gentleness. This, this is how we overcome. This is how the lion leads us forward. Yet, there are beasts and there are enemies, and there are temptations, and there are difficulties, and there are challenges. There is depression, and there is anxiety. There are, there are things that we could fear. How do we live? How do we hold out hope when everyone is cynical? How do we remain patient when it feels like things are going in the wrong direction? How do we extend love when it feels like we are alone and left behind? How do we extend ourselves to those who are different than us, when it feels like no one understands what we are going through. Remember the lion we long for is also the lamb that we need. We can go with our lion. We can follow our lion. And we can know that the lion of Judah is with us. And if you doubt this, there's a young woman named Judy We'd like to tell you a story. Today we have a special privilege of being able to hear a brand new children's book that our own Walter Kondratowski wrote called The Lion of Judy. If you want to know, if you want to know how to live and miss all of our challenges to live with hope and love and perseverance, endurance, loving one another, uh, loving those around us, serving even when it hurts, maybe... Judy can help you learn. 
listen to this. All right, um, so Scott and Lindsay, um, Walter's going to have a reading of the book, a separate video, but what I want to do is I want to just say a prayer that's going to come after that book and transition us into a final song. Sound like a plan? All right. Jesus, we thank you that not only are you the lamb that leads, line that leads us forward, you're the lamb that we need that forgives our sins, that heals us of our wounds, that gives meaning to our suffering. And God, there may be people here who might not know you like Judy knows you, doesn't, doesn't know you as their own lion. Uh, maybe they've known you, God, as somebody kind of distant and someone to appease, but now they, maybe they finally see you as somebody who has suffered for them. And, God, uh, and for those who are listening, if you've never begun a relationship with God or if you want this lion in your life like this, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray with me to receive him into your life. Jesus, I thank you that you are the lion who could lead me, who can protect me, and you're the lamb that I need to suffer for me, for the forgiveness of my sins. And I receive your loving leadership and the salvation that you offer in your blood. And God, may you be that line with me forever.